And, uh, first of all, Brian uh, Swami, who is responsible for organizing tonight's meeting, we really appreciate him uh, uh, going the extra mile to uh, make this arrangement. I think it's a very timely uh, opportunity for us pilots that, to fly GMA. And uh, we know that there are that there's equipment on the airplane that not necessarily everybody knows how to operate. And Brian thought it would be a good idea if we assemble this meeting to maybe uh, provide a refresher for some of us or some some uh, better knowledge as to uh, how we might want to better operate that airplane. So Brian, thank you very much for organizing tonight's meeting. Welcome all. Extremely <laughs> pleased with the turnout speaks well for the club, and uh, I know that uh, this evening will be a jam full of information for you. And uh, we're really pleased that we've got Jim uh, Neighbor here to make his, uh, the presentation to us tonight. Jim has a very, very extensive background in the aviation industry. He's currently uh, uh, operations manager, or at least uh, uh, maintenance manager, rather, <coughs> Of uh, the Peregrine Aerial Services Company, and uh, he's been involved in all kinds of activities. Uh, I made note of a few of them. Delivering newspapers, I noticed he uh, <laughs> yeah. talked about that a lot. Uh, he's been involved in survey gigs. He's been instructing air taxi involvement, uh, to name just a few. Operation manager. He's been an owner of an organization, so he's got over 3,000 hours of uh, pilot in command, and so he's very well qualified to talk to us tonight. So please join me in giving a warm Abbotsford for Client, Client Club welcome to Jim Neighbor. Welcome. Thank you, everybody. Yeah, as uh, as was touched on. Uh, uh, I'm currently the maintenance manager at Peregrine Air Surveys. Um, in the past, I have been an operations manager, chief pilot, but uh, maintenance is something that's very, very important, and I'm sure Brian has impressed other upon you people. Um, so this is what I've dedicated myself to. We've sort of split up the roles, chief pilot, operations manager, and I've, I've stayed on with the maintenance. And uh, that has given me an opportunity to learn uh, a heck of a lot about what makes it tick and uh, has given me the ability to also add equipment to our aircraft that I think are important and this is some of the equipment that uh, GMA has. Uh, Jim, will you may, maybe tell me a little bit about your company? Uh, for those of oh, us that yeah. are unanointed, I, I'm sorry, I have to be guilty, I, I'm not too familiar. No so problem. We, we're, not, we're not like a uh, charter company where, uh, you know, like Island Express where you have more awareness of with, you know, signage and fly here for this much and that sort of thing. Uh, Peregrine Aerial Surveys is a relatively young company who have been around for four years. It was the offshoot of an earlier survey company called uh, Selkirk Remote Sensing uh, that had been operating for the past 30 years before the owner retired. Uh, one of the employees along with me, he's the president and I, I came across as the operations manager, chief pilot. We started out initially out here in Abbotsford, uh, just beside the Baron, and have since moved over to the second floor of the Shell Aero Center. Uh, but basically what Peregrine Aerial Survey does is, uh, as the name implies, do aerial survey. This can involve either a photographic survey or uh, a LIDAR scanner. And most people will be f most familiar with LIDAR as the uh, laser gun that the police get you with when they when you've been speeding. And it's the exact same principle. That uh, the, the device shoots a laser beam down, bounces off the ground, and when it comes back, it can actually time the distance in between and get a perfect metric for it. So what it ends up doing is it ends up giving a three-dimensional point cloud, a bunch of points all together, and then it ties it all together in almost sort of like a wireframe, and then they can use that for any sort of survey measurements that they want. It's it's a it's a heck of a lot more versatile and a lot faster than having the traditional with the transit and the guy holding the pole and everything like that. Essentially does the same thing. Um, the photo side of it works very much the same way and that the picture is taken. Every camera lens has a bit of distortion in it. Uh, you're most familiar with that with the wide angle fish eye lenses, how it distorts everything. Things towards the side don't look the same as they do in the front. 
so in essence, post-process, the software will lay that image down. It's called ortho-rectification, rectifying the, the inherent uh, distortion in the lens, excuse me, and then they're able to do the same thing. They can determine from this point to this point, uh, once it's corrected, that the measurement is this much, this far. So essentially what we do is uh, we work on behalf of mapping companies, government, forestry, and uh, they give us contracts. They want certain things looked at. It could be something like BC Hydro, looking at their, their right of way and everything. And this is where LiDAR is really good, the point cloud. It can actually see the dangle of the high, high tension transmission lines, and they can see if they're getting too much slack in it, that sort of thing. As well as road building, um, uh, we do a lot of uh, tree farm licensing, TFLs, where the government has said to a logging company that you can cut so much wood out of this geographic area, and then they send us in afterwards to actually see if you just start uh, a fine structure, that's uh, a route that a lot of people start, uh, 703, touched on that, and then finally survey. I uh, spent most of my time in the PA31 series. Uh, it's a great workhorse, the Piper Navajo, uh, be it the, either the, uh, the short body Navajo version or the longer body Chieftain version. Uh, great for cargo, great for people. Uh, did a lot of uh, Tofino passenger runs as well as the, the freight uh, for bank bags and that sort of thing. We've covered this already. Uh, th uh, thanks to the board of directors, Brian, for getting me out here. Uh, and basically, I'm just here to help you understand how the instrumentation works and uh, how you can use it to get the most out of it. Uh, main thrust is safety. As I just touched on with Wyala, you know, any tool that uh, can you know, allow you to take care of the aircraft better means the, the safer you are, ultimately. Um, informal, we've already touched on this. Just put up your hand. Okay. Anybody has any questions, feel free to stop me at any time because if you're wondering it, somebody else is probably wondering it as well. And as you figured out, I have a tendency to grab it on and talk really fast. So just tell me to slow down or, you know, <laughs> if uh, you're having a problem with it. So we'll get into just a little bit of review, ground school style. Uh, the four cycle engine, uh, also known as the uh, auto engine, uh, invented by Nicholas Otto in the late 1800s. And then it was Gottlieb Daimler and uh, Wilhelm Maybach Daimler you probably recognize as a name that's still uh, around today uh, when they formed uh, Daimler Vince. So if you look, we have a very slow animation. I couldn't figure out in PowerPoint how to speed this up, but it's an animated GIF. Uh, when we start on number one, the induction, the induction stroke, the piston's moving down, sucking air in through the intake valve. Intake valve closes, comes up on the compression stroke, and then number three, you get the ignition stroke, power obviously to the crankshaft. Just imagine that tilted on its side and air cooled for our application, but uh, I found it obviously in an auto, automotive uh, sort of vein. And uh, yeah, really easy to remember, sucks when you think blue. This is important mainly because when we get to talking about how the engine module works, uh, really. Uh, the light homing engine, such as like any aircraft uh, that uh, we fly, they made sewing machines originally, but divested away from that uh, to make automotive engines solely. The first uh, engine that they made for, uh, for mass production was uh, a radio engine, the R680 there. Then we uh, moved away from the radio engines. You, we don't see them much anymore other than beavers and everything. And uh, the main reason for that is uh, drag. They were nice compact packages, but they were very big. So not very deep, but very, very wide. And this, this gave a lot of drag to the design of aircraft. So the idea was to move forward uh, advances in metallurgy and technology in order to make an engine that would produce the power of a radio but have a very small frontal area. And this is where we got onto the uh, air-cooled engines. So Lycoming, which became uh, Avro Lycoming in 1939, began working on the horizontally opposed engines that we're all familiar with in general aviation aircraft uh, in the early 1940s. And as I said, the, the intention was to get the power of a radio in a smaller package. The O360, everybody's flown behind one, and they're, they're well loved, great engine. Uh, they were prototyping them in 1950, and it became a whole family. I'm sure you've seen the nomenclature O360, 
dash A1A, and uh, all, all sorts of different uh, variants, different power output uh, from 145 to 225 horsepower. And uh, first certified in 1955, and uh, used in both the Cherokee and the 172. So that's uh, where most people have seen it before. Well, the weights and specs at the bottom doesn't doesn't really matter, but uh, nonetheless, they ended up doing exactly what they set out to do. They got the power of the radial in a smaller package, which made it more aerodynamic, um, which allowed us to go further on the same amount of fuel. So. Which brings us to how you use the engine properly. Engine management is key. You want to, uh, I'm sure Brian, if you want to find out how much <laughs> this, this sort of thing costs, and I'm sure you have discussions at board meetings and everything, how to uh, keep costs down and uh, make, it, make it so it's sustainable for the club, uh, you have to treat engines properly. Uh, anything that you mistreat is not going to last. So you have to, have to, I can't stress it enough, just be smooth, power application, always smooth, never, uh, it's, it's usually on power changes, abrupt power changes, that things break and fail. Uh, it's not very often that it happens in a steady state, like a cruise mode. Um, so yes, I already just said that, important fiscally, but safety as well. Treat your engine nicely. And this is what this is all about. We're, uh, we're going to talk about how you use the data that you obtain from the JPI 700 in order to be able to uh, treat the engine as nice as possible. Really. Stroke instrumentation. Yeah, I'm sure you've seen it. That a lot of them don't even really have any markings. <laughs> you've just got zero and red line. Um, the JPI has come a long way from that uh, in in sensor technology, probe technology, and you were able to quantify these things a lot closer than the, the gauges. And in a lot of general aviation aircraft, there's not an ongoing instruction for continuing airworthiness for gauge calibration. Uh, there are for fuel gauges, uh, but a lot of the other, the oil temperature gauge, who knows? Has it ever been calibrated since it left the factory? Has there been some drift? You're never quite sure. So, stock instrumentation is a guess at best. So we're familiar with the standard ones, oil pressure, oil temperature, RPM. We know that RPM is calibrated, calibrated on a regular basis and everything. But uh, we're not really interested in them because we're talking about the, the JP instruments, uh, both the 700 and the uh, 450. Uh, anybody that's not familiar with GMA's layout, the 700 is the engine monitor, and then the 450 is the fuel mobilizer. And as I just touched on, the uh, information that you obtain from these instruments is way, way better than soft. So as far as a little bit of history, uh, back in the 1960s, there was a petroleum engineer named uh, Al Hundrick that introduced the first ma mar math market EGT gauge, and uh, that's the Alcor gauge. Uh, I'm sure some of you have come across those. Uh, just a simple gauge. Lack of uh, absolutely no markings uh, as far as absolute values. You're just looking for relative values. So it has a white pointer that will show uh, that will show the current EGT, and then the orange pointer, which can be reset with the knob on the face, is a telltale that tells you the maximum that you've already you've hit. So you can lean, lean, lean until it peaks, and then it'll leave the orange marker there, and it'll start going back down the other side, and then you can rich up to pull it back down to the rich side. A peak EGT, which is basically what we've all been, all been taught to do. Uh, interesting to note, only one probe for all the cylinders. So they, they, it was just sort of mixed together at the collector. And so you didn't have any real idea of whether you were <coughs> firing on all cylinders, so to speak. Their next attempt at uh, improving the product design was somebody acknowledged that. Well, hey, we really don't know when it's all collected and done with one EGT probe, what each individual cylinder was doing. And this led to uh, a partnership between Alcor and KS Avionics to make a multi probe gauge. So basically, that ended up with an individual probe in each exhaust stack. And then obviously hooked up to the gauge, and then you could see what each individual cylinder was doing at any given time. 
So, as far as exhaust gas temperature is concerned, most pilots think of EGT like anything else. You start, as your needle starts going up on your oil pressure, your oil temperature, and your stop gauges, you start to get a little bit worried. You know, we're, we're all taught, and it's just basic knowledge, that cooler is better. You're not, you're not stressing things as much. Uh, this can be true, but there are exceptions because of different factors involved. Uh, design. This is something we see on the NAMO uh, quite a bit as far as where the cylinders are uh, and the shape of the exhaust axe coming off it. You can get different EGT readings, just absolutely bone stock, um, and it's replicated across you know, one Navajo to the other. They all seem to be that way. It almost seems to be like a slight pyramid sort of shape with the uh, highest EGTs on the inner cylinders and the, because they're the straightest exhaust, exhaust runs out and then, or closest exhaust runs out and then the other ones tend to be longer uh, where the probe positioning is just from actual, uh, the construction and the constraints, design constraints of where you can put the probe. Uh, also, when these gauges are installed, it's up to the AME where they think that they can actually fit the probe. So, a probe further away from the exhaust port. Yes. I was going to say, sorry, Jim. Uh, no, like, don't they sorry. put it on the uh, the hottest cylinder, basically? Then, if you got the one probe. If you got the one probe, yes. On the hottest one. That yes. way, everything else is. Everything else should should be yeah. cool. Yes, yeah. yes. And uh, in a lot of aircraft or light homing engines, this this is usually the number number three uh, or number four. Uh, but at some point, you can have one of our planes came to us, and because the cylinders are, are all the the same, are meant to be interchangeable where they put. They all have the bosses. Uh, for them, and uh, somebody put it in number six <laughs> in one of our airplanes. Obviously, some AME at some point when they had re and read it or something, just screwed her on in here because it, it had a whole bunch of slack in the line, and there it was in number six. So, uh, this is basically a representation of what we were watching in the graphical uh, before of the, of the uh, strokes of the engine. So, you can see the final standing in the middle of it. Uh, crankshaft uh, rotation. This is top dead center, uh, bottom dead center. So when we're starting at top dead center, the piston is on a downstroke, on the intake, sucking in air. And then it, at 180 degrees, right when it reaches the bottom, this will reverse, start going back up on the compression stroke. Ignition is at the top at 360, and then it drives the piston down, and then back up again, so forth, so forth, as the engine rotates. You can see from uh, the instantaneous combustion temperature, this is actually the temperature inside the cylinder as this is all happening. So as the, as the cool fuel air charge enters the cylinder, you've actually got a very low temperature. As it compresses, the temperature goes up. Uh, anybody that's got a compressor at home for industrial use or at work understands this principle. <laughs> the compressed air, uh, the compressor head gets really up really hot from, uh, the, uh, from compression. So as it starts to compress, the temperature goes, goes up and, uh, and the ignition starts, then it just starts to skyrocket all, uh, all the way up. And this is where you will see, as, as the flame front passes, propagates through the compressed fuel air mixture, this is where you'll get your highest temperatures. And uh, it, it's considerable. You can see on the, on the, on the tape here, zero degrees Fahrenheit, 4,000 degrees Fahrenheit. It can quite easily get into the 3,000 degree Fahrenheit range. And probably at this point, some people were scratching their heads and going, well, how does the aluminum? GT, on the other hand, shows what's happening when the exhaust valve opens. Because <coughs> really, that's what you're seeing. You're seeing the exhaust gas coming past, past the probe, and it's being quantified. And this is after the stress is going down. So this is why I, I, I keep on saying, you can't necessarily rely on EGT as being the most, indica uh, the most important indicator. High CHCs often indicate high engine stress. EGTs don't indicate stress, but rather loss of energy at the tailpipe is essentially what it is. If you're seeing a, a cooler EGT, that means that your potential kinetic energy that is stored in the fuel is actually leaving of the exhaust valve rather than being harnessed uh, under the power trip. So it's important to know this as well, 
this is where EGT is, is a, uh, the EGT probes are a very valuable tool, is that if you suddenly see, and it's happened to me unfortunately too many times, if you see the EGT drop suddenly relative to everything else, as I say, each engine will have its pattern, and as you guys fly GMA, you'll see, you'll, you'll notice a pattern or shape uh, to how all the four cylinders relate to one another. And if you see one, if you see that pattern change uh, extremely, it might be time to talk to the acre and just have them take a look at it. Do a quick compression check, uh, check on it while it's warm, just to see what's going on with that cylinder. Because if you have a leaking valve and it's letting it all leak out the exhaust, uh, leak out the exhaust valve, uh, you're, you're going to see less on your EGT. Same with blow-by, low compression. It'll start, you know, like if you blow past the piston ring, the whole charge is going practically into the, into the crankcase rather than out the tailpipe. So your EGT tails are just absolutely no side. Uh, lean to where you normally would, and then adjust based on CHT on the rich side of the So basically mm -hmm. add more fuel in until your CHTs are acceptable. When I say acceptable, uh, I'm talking about somewhere in the vicinity of 400 degrees Fahrenheit. So, uh, try to go lower if your fuel burn is not atrocious, like if you're not just sucking the gas back. It's, it's nicer to the engine, right back to the, the beginning of the presentation when we were talking about being nice to your engine. Uh, aluminum loses half its tensile strength at 400 degrees Fahrenheit. <laughs> it never comes back. And this is where, especially in high compression engines, uh, turbocharged engines, this is where you actually compromise the actual body of the cylinder and that's where you get cracks in between like the spark plug holes of the valves and yeah, basically trashes the cylinder. So, so uh, the fuel monitor is the GPI 450. Once again, the instructions are available on uh, JP Instruments site. Uh, the, the point of hand, limit CHTs to be kind to the engine. And Brian and I were discussing this a couple weeks ago as we were sort of formulating this. And uh, he had actually noticed this without anybody even telling him. That it, it seemed to him that it was more important as far as uh, using the monitor to actually use it to be nice to the engine as far as CHTs are concerned, rather than using it for just strictly, well, uh, let's see how lean we can go and how much fuel we can save. Uh, because it's basically a fool's errand. These things, aircraft parts are so <coughs> expensive. Labor is, you know, it's not as expensive as your car dealership in some cases. Still uh, a considerable load of so you don't worry about the EGTs displayed as being <coughs> equal, like I touched on that, it's all going to be different by probe placement, blow by in that particular cylinder, it'll even change over time. So it's, it's sort of a dynamic thing. Uh, be aware, but you know, don't, don't necessarily stress if they're not flat as a board right across the top, because I really have never seen it in uh, the, the number of installations that we have. It's not a sign of a poorly working engine. Uh, there is a diff display as it cycles through on the, on the JPI 700. Uh, it'll, one of the parameters it shows, it says diff such and such. And all it's doing is telling me the difference between the highest cylinder and the lowest cylinder as far as EGT. Great, but you know, it doesn't really do much as far as uh, giving us the, uh, any more data that is useful for us. So the uh, most important difference is actually between the fuel flow per cylinder uh, when all are at peak EGT, and this is known as the GAMI spread. Uh, GAMI uh, it is an acronym, but probably not what you assume it would, uh, would be. It's not a technical term. It's actually a General Aircraft Modifications Incorporated. It's a company down in the States that uh, makes fuel, uh, calibrated fuel injectors for the uh, turbocharged, or not necessarily the turbocharged, but the injected Lycoming engines. So they will actually get, uh, make a fuel injector to your specification to try and bring the fuel flows uh, very, very closely when they're all at the same EGT. It was important, so I had to add again, for the, these planes that you guys fly with the carburetors, the distribution of fuel is not as exact as being injected straight at, uh, straight at the cylinder. So you're, you're generally not going to see an acceptable gammy uh, or a very tight gammy spread. Basically what represents a, a GAMI spread, each one of the cylinders indicated by a different color. And so you can see their relative EGT peaks. And then this is what's termed the GAMI spread. From number three here, it peaks 
over here at 13.7 gallons per hour, let's say, and then number one peaks over here at like 14.1. So you're talking about a spread of like about 0.4 gallons per hour as far as the gamming spread goes, but we won't go over that other side, and because of the unequal distribution of the cylinders, it will actually also run, run a little bit rough. Not harmfully rough, but nonetheless, it's, it's not going to feel comfortable, and it's hard on the engine mounts and, and that sort of thing. So, uh, But you can see considerable, I, I have played with it on one of our airplanes that it doesn't have those gamma injectors, but the spread itself is about 0.4, so it actually works not too bad. And I can pull it back into the lean of peak side, and the cylinder head temperatures go right way down, exactly where you want them to be. Uh, EGTs go down as well. Your fuel flow just absolutely plummets. It's absolutely amazing. And really, you don't lose that much in a turbocharged application because you're able to make up by adding more manifold pressure. So you'll watch your manifold pressure drop as you go lean of peak, and then you can just bump up the throttles a little bit more to bring it up. And what did I, we usually do, it's about 20 gallons an hour per side in, in cruise, we'll call it 19 for, uh, for argument's sake, and I was able to only lose 15 knots of airspeed uh, for 7 gallons of fuel. So I went down, I went down to about 12 and a half, and I was only about 15 knots slower than what I would be. So, and uh, I say don't bother with the lean find function, but yeah, maybe I'm being you know, a little bit harsh on this. Uh, letting my own personal preferences sort of come in. I know where the engine will run just because of so much experience with it. Um, that I just sort of set it and then I go by fuel flow and then look at my CHDs. But anyhow, uh, I think the next slide is... Yeah, here we go. This is... <coughs> So this is just uh, the JPI short uh, video from JPI on how it operates. Thank you for purchasing your EDM 700 series engine data management system. You will discover that this is the finest engine monitoring instrument available for piston engines. This video will walk you through the operation of the EDM 700 and answer the most common questions about the instrument. Think of your EDM 700 as your personal flight engineer. Always there, working in the background, constantly watching over your engine while you concentrate on flying the aircraft. You can make an entire flight without ever pushing a button, if you so choose. Yet your EDM 700 will be monitoring your engine parameters three times a second and will warn you instantly if any parameter exceeds the program limit. Let's jump in and see how it works. The EDM 700 collects data and displays it for you in a useful way. You use the EDM 700 to monitor engine temperatures and voltages, adjust the fuel air mixture, and diagnose engine malfunctions. Let's examine the analog display. Central to the display is the exhaust gas temperature, or EGT, bar graph presentation. The height of each column represents the EGT. The last column represents oil temperature or turbine inlet temperature, depending on the options installed in your aircraft. The range of the EGT columns is red line at the top down to one half of red line at the bottom. This is called the percentage view because you are looking at a percentage of red line. The normalized view allows you to see small, subtle changes in temperature. When you change to the normalized view, hold the right button for three seconds. All column heights are set to the identical half height. Any changes are shown as an increase or decrease in column height. A one bar change in column height represents a 10 degrees change. The normalized view permits rapid visualization of EGT trends rather than a percentage of red line. The missing segment in the column represents the cylinder head temperature trend. Above each column is a number corresponding to the engine cylinder number. The rightmost column, if present, displays oil temperature. If turbine inlet temperature is installed, then the rightmost column will indicate this with a T above that column. Beneath the bar graph is the alphanumeric display. A single index dot above one column indicates which cylinder is being displayed on this numerical display. When the index dot is beneath a cylinder number, 
1 through 6. The digital display shows the EGT on the left 4 digits and the CHT on the right 3 digits. Other engine parameters shown in this display are the rate of shock cooling of the most rapidly cooling cylinder in degrees per minute. Lightcombing recommends that you keep this value below 50 degrees per minute. The bus voltage. The difference between the hottest and coolest exhaust gas temperatures. The outside air temperature, if you have this option installed. Oil temperature, if you have this option installed. If you have the fuel flow option installed, there are other displays which will be described later in this video. There are buttons on the front panel. These two buttons control all functions of the EDM 700. On the left side is the step button and on the right side is the lean find button. 10 minutes after the EDM 700 is turned on, it will automatically index through all parameters. Tapping this step button will always take you into the manual indexing mode. Here you can observe each parameter value for as long as you want. To resume the automatic indexing, tap Lean Find and then tap Step. To switch between the percentage view and the normalized view, hold the Lean Find button down for 5 seconds. We'll explain more on the use of these two buttons as we proceed through the video. Using cruise configuration, use the Lean Find mode to identify the first cylinder to reach peak EGT. Note that this is the leanest cylinder, not necessarily the hottest cylinder. There are two methods of leaning. The standard method is the default, leaning rich of peak. If you have GAMI fuel injectors, you can use the lean of peak method. This video describes both methods. First, we will show the standard rich a peak method. Begin the leaning process by pre-leaning the mixture to about 50 degrees below the estimated peak on any one of the cylinders. For example, let's say that you have determined that 1350 is the pre-lean value for your aircraft. Now wait about 30 seconds for temperatures to stabilize. To enter the lean fine mode, tap the lean fine button you will see the exhaust gas temperature of the hottest cylinder on the left display. Lean the mixture at a rate of about 5 degrees per second without pausing. When there is a 15 degrees rise in the EGT, the lean find will become active, indicated by the flashing dot under the number of the hottest cylinder. If you have the fuel flow option, the fuel flow rate will be shown on the right display. <clears throat> Stop leaning when you momentarily see leanest on the display and a column begins flashing. On the left is displayed the temperature of the first EGT to peak. If you tap Lean Fine, the left display will toggle to display the number of degrees below peak of the first EGT to peak, displayed as a negative number. Tap Lean Find again to toggle to the actual EGT value. To see the captured peak EGT value, hold the Lean Find button. In most cases, you will now be on the lean side of peak by about 10 degrees. While the column is flashing, slowly enrich the mixture. The temperature will increase, returning to peak. Stop enriching at the desired exhaust gas temperature. To use the lean of peak method, tap LF and then immediately hold the step and the LF buttons until you see lean L. For the duration of the flight, your EDM will remember to use the Lean and Peak method any time you use the Lean Fine mode. Lean the mixture at a rate of about 5 degrees per second without pausing. When there is a 15 degrees rise in EGT, the Lean Fine will become active, indicated by the flashing dot under the number of the hottest cylinder. If you have the fuel flow option, the fuel flow rate will be shown on the right display. When the first EGT peaks, you will see the word leanest, and the graph display will invert to what we call the icicle graph. Continue leaning until the last EGT peaks, as indicated by the word richest and the flashing EGT number and column. The flashing will stop, and two cylinders will be flagged by dots, the leanest and the richest. The number of degrees below peak for the last EGT to peak is shown in the display. If you hold the Lean Find button, you will see the captured peak of the richest cylinder on the left 
and the gamete spread on the right. The gamete spread is the change in fuel flow from the first to the last EGT to peak. That is going to run. There are secondary functions, as I said in the video, uh, to the step button. No, I actually didn't say this in the video, sorry. Uh, secondary function is you can also uh, have limits set programmed inside the JPI that if your CHT or your EGT uh, exceeds the uh, preset amount, it'll actually flash at you. You saw that in the video with when it had the low battery bus at 23 and a half volts. It was actually flashing that at you. That can get pretty annoying. So uh, if it's not set correctly, um, and I've experienced this, ours has fuel flow built into it in the 760. And if you've forgotten to reset the fuel uh, after you take off and you're just doing a short flight, sometimes it will tell you that you know, you're reaching your, your 45 minutes of, of reserve, so it'll flash at you, res, res, res. So if you start getting detonation, this is when things can, things can melt, pistons can melt and stuff, because that boundary layer is being disrupted. So if temperature's peaked, starts to come down, the exhaust valve opens and then uh, starts, starts to lay everything out. So in essence, when you're looking at what an EGT gauge is telling you, and we're assuming an independent probe for each cylinder, is you're actually getting an average of this whole, uh, this whole cycle here. Because as the gas is, uh, or you're basically getting an average once the exhaust gas open, uh, opens. So you're getting an average of that section there. So you're not exactly sure how hot it is getting at its hottest point, but it's a reasonable approximation. But, uh, so it fluctuates many times per rotation. What the monitor shows is an average. Uh, and it's not necessarily an indicator of a specific engine stress, because it is an average. You could have a very, very high peak, very, very low low, and the average will actually come out to be the same as a, as a lower peak and a higher low, and uh, so you get the, you'd end up with the same average. Uh, so it's not absolutely crucial for EGT to be a certain temperature unless, uh, and I'll touch on it in a minute, there are specific requirements. So there are things that can cause engine stress, uh, or things that cause engine stress that can cause EGT to go down. Advanced timing is one of them, meaning that you fire uh, sooner before it actually is, is reaching top dead center and everything. That can actually get to the point, the piston's traveling up, the charge is exploding, and it's of course, you meant to time it so it's just coming up as the charge is, is pushing down on it. But if it's still coming up while the charge is exploding, that can just hammer, really, really hammer. And I'm sure anybody that's uh, got a bad tank of gas and then tried to lug their car up a hill has experienced that knocking sound. You know, you're wondering, well, the engine's under high load and you're wondering, what, what the heck is that knocking noise? That's exactly what that knocking noise is. Is you're actually getting pre-detonation, not in the case of advanced timing, but because of bad fuel. And which leads us to the other thing that the J, uh, JP700, JPI700 quantifies is cylinder head temperature. Now this is something that uh, I'm going to you know spend a bit of time on because it is more important than EGT uh, as far as cylinder uh, as an indicator of engine stress. So cylinder head temperature is the real killer. And I've, I've spent a lot of time behind these, these things. And the good thing about the JPI is it'll actually lie. We have a port right beside ours, and then I have a data cable that goes into the laptop, and using their, their trained monitoring software, you can download flights. And so I'll snoop on the other pilots. <laughs> so uh, the fuel monitor is the JPI 450. Once again, the instructions are available on uh, JP Instruments site of the JPI 450. Up at the top, we have our fuel flow per hour. And generally, the uh, shown in gallons. It's the way everything works because uh, it's a U.S. instrument, and I don't think they're ever going to make a provision for it to show us in liters. I know our JPI 760 doesn't even have the choice. It's always in gallons, so you're always left doing a little bit of mathematics to get back to your, what your fuel receipt says. But that's only fuel re receipt reconciliation. And besides, our performance charts in the POH or AFM are always going to be in U.S. gallons anyhow. Um, so it shows the following fuel parameter in this box here uh, based on the lights. We have five lights down at the bottom, and auto enters the automatic scan mode, and step, step three, 
I don't think we have to believe that one too much. Uh, the, as far as the lights down at the bottom, five lights. Number one is uh, USD, not, not greenbacks, but uh, we're talking total fuel used, used uh, and then total fuel remaining. Um, these are your two main ones that you're going to be you're going to be using, uh, keeping track of uh, how much you have left to go, uh, especially remaining. <laughs> very, very important. Uh, these the, and then time to empty. I also find that that, that one's really handy, as it's in auto mode and it's cycling through. Just with a quick glance, you can see two two thirty six. Oh, I've got two hours and thirty six minutes, or at this power setting, uh, until I exhaust what I have in the tanks. So it's great, uh, especially for us in survey where we're pressed to stay as long as we possibly can on site to make more money, uh, because we bill out our our acquisition billing is going to go on a limb here and say almost four times what our ferry rate is. Uh, considering we fly privately, you, know, you don't have to worry about that. Uh, these last two are referenced to waypoint from the GPS, so you can actually in the JDI 450 have it feed in and <coughs> it'll tell you exactly how much you have remaining and it'll actually start flighting this well in advance. Hey, if you've just changed your flight plan on the GPS to show something that's completely implausible as opposed to fuel, load, yeah, you're, you're going to figure it out through those two settings. Um, basically, measuring consumption by time assumes constant fuel flow. We, we all know that. It, in cruise, great, you know, uh, it's time in your tanks, like the old Transport Canada poster with the, the wristwatch. Yeah, it's, that's wonderful if you're spending a lot of time in your, in your steady state cruise mode. However, if you're doing like we do a survey where they need the proper height above ground in order to get the right sample distance, you're constantly, especially if you've got a hill here, you're stepping up, stepping down. I have one guy that kind of has, that way it precludes having to time precisely your phases of flight, either the climb or cruise. And they offer a great, uh, great safety advantage, uh, as far as that goes, with a, a flashing warning. Hey, you're coming up on your reserve. Yes, sir? So does it actually physically measure the amount of fuel going through the fuel line that's being fed to the carburetor? Bingo. Because I know like in a, in a fuel jet system, you need someone actually fed right back into the fuel tank? Yep, and it, it has to be installed in such a way that it takes into account for the return. You know, return, like you say, a return fuel system. Yeah, it has. Yeah, to, uh, uses a turbine and a fuel line. Basically, it's a little, just like a turbocharger, uh, spinning around inside, and each time it goes around, uh, it produces a pulse, like a hall sensor, optical sensor sort of idea, and uh, the multiple pulses uh, then indicate to the instrument how much fuel is actually going through. The more fuel moves through, the faster the turbine goes. The more Thank you for purchasing your FuelScan 450 fuel management system. You'll discover that this is the finest fuel monitoring system available for piston engines. This video will walk you through the operation of the FuelScan 450 and answer the most common questions about the instrument. Think of your FuelScan 450 as your personal flight engineer. Always there, working in the background, constantly monitoring your fuel consumption while you concentrate on flying the aircraft. The JPI Fuel Scan 450 features a dual display, always showing your fuel flow rate on the upper display and other parameters on the bottom. Every Fuel Scan 450 will interface with your panel mount or handheld GPS. There are no extra options to purchase. All the features described in this video are standard. The FuelScan 450 is advisory only and is not approved as a primary instrument. The FuelScan 450 relies on a very reliable fuel flow sensor. This sensor is mounted in the fuel line prior to the fuel distributor or carburetor and measures the actual fuel flowing through the line. Inside the sensor is a turbine wheel that rotates at a rate proportional to the instantaneous amount of fuel passing through it. The rotating turbine interrupts a light beam, and an optical sensor counts the pulses of the interrupted beam. A microprocessor in the FuelScan 450 counts the pulses and converts the count to fuel flow. The 
Fuel Scan 450 will also track the total fuel used and the fuel remaining. But remember, always base your fuel calculations on the known amount of fuel in the tank. No fuel measuring instrument is a substitute for a thorough pre-flight check. The pilot in command must always verify the amount of fuel in the aircraft before takeoff. Let's jump in and see how the Fuel Scan 450 works. The Fuel Scan 450 displays up to six fuel-related parameters. Some parameters will be available only if you connect the Fuel Scan 450 to your GPS. The upper display always shows your current fuel flow rate in the selected units. You may select gallons, liters, or pounds as the fuel units. Normally, the Fuel Scan 450 will automatically index through all the parameters. The small indicator lights at the bottom of the display tell you which parameter is being shown on the lower digital display. If you tap the Step button, you can manually step through each parameter. Fuel used. How much fuel has been used since you last refueled? This number will always become larger as fuel is consumed. You can instead show the fuel used on a long multi-fuel stop flight, and we will see later in this video how to do that. You can reset the fuel used display to zero by holding the auto button for a few seconds until the used display is set to zero. Fuel remaining. How much total fuel remains in the aircraft? The Fuel Scan 450 does not differentiate between fuel in various tanks. Only total fuel remaining in the aircraft is calculated. Hours and minutes remaining. Based on the current fuel flow rate displays the remaining endurance time. This parameter is most meaningful during cruise. During sea level climb, the fuel flow rate will be almost twice that of cruise and the endurance indication will be about half of actual. On the other hand, during a power reduction descent, the endurance will indicate more time than is actually available when flying at cruise power. Fuel required to next waypoint. This parameter will be displayed only if your Fuel Scan 450 is receiving flight data from your GPS. This will tell you how much fuel is required to get to the next waypoint or destination programmed on your GPS based on your current fuel flow rate and present position. Fuel reserve when you arrive at your next waypoint. This parameter will be displayed only if your Fuel Scan 450 is receiving flight data from your GPS. This will tell you how much fuel reserve you can expect when you arrive at your next waypoint or destination program on your GPS at the current fuel flow rate. Distance per fuel units. Both the required and the reserved indicator lights will be on at the same time. This parameter will be displayed only if your Fuel Scan 450 is receiving flight data from your GPS. It will tell you your miles per fuel unit, such as miles per gallon, miles per liter, or miles per pound. It is based on your current ground speed and current fuel flow rate. To return to the automatic scan, just tap the Auto button. The Fuel Scan 450 will begin scanning. That's all there is to using the Fuel Scan 450 during flight you have complete control of the display. If there is a low fuel or low time alarm, the scan will stop and the indicator light will flash. To acknowledge the alarm, tap the step button and the scan will resume. We will now look at what to do at initial engine start. The two most likely scenarios are either you top the tanks before startup or you didn't. In either case, you will tell the fuel scan 450 what the fuel status is. Upon power-up, the Fuel Scan 450 runs through a quick self-test. Next, the Fuel Scan 450 will ask you if you fueled the aircraft. It flashes, fill, no. If you didn't fill the aircraft or change the amount of fuel, tap, step. That's all you have to do. If you did fuel the aircraft, tap, auto. The display will show the full tank capacity. You will program this amount into the instrument once when you first set up your Fuel Scan 450, and we will show you how to do that later in this video. To accept this amount for full tanks, tap Step. If you added or removed fuel from the aircraft, tap Auto twice. You will see Fill Add. Tap Step. You will now tell the Fuel Scan 450 how much fuel you added or removed from the aircraft. 
If you hold the auto button, the amount shown will count up. It will not count any higher than would normally fill the tanks. If you remove fuel, tap the auto button repeatedly and the fuel amount shown will count down. When you're done, tap step. If your aircraft has auxiliary tanks or fuel tabs, you can program two possible fill levels. The first tap of the auto button will show the lower fill level. Tapping the auto button again will show the higher fill level. Tap step when you have selected the amount of fuel in the aircraft. What if you forgot to tell the fuel scan 450 that Uh, the last thing that Brian wanted me to talk about is uh, the audio panel in uh, GMA. It's a KMA24 audio panel. Uh, part of the King. Uh, King was observed by Honeywell, so it's uh, now a, a Honeywell silver crown package. Um, very, very common. You know, like, <laughs> I think 8 out of 10 planes <laughs> that I've flown uh, have had a silver crown package in it at one time or, or the other. So. Um, this is something you're going to come across quite a bit, not just Jim. You're touching it, make sure that you have the right button pushed in. Because uh, like I say, you could be going for COM2, kind of sweep it with your COM1 with your finger. Uh, they tend to be very, very close. COM1 and COM2, NAV1 and NAV2. Should have spaced them out a little bit. Intersperse the columns with the NAVs. Uh, maybe that's confusing as well. Uh, use of the squelch knob is another another great tool that you can use to prevent uh, this sort of thing happening where you're tuned out literally and figuratively. Um, just give the squelch knob a quick flick. Either pull out the knob if that's what activates squelch on your radio, or I'm thinking of the old KX170 or 175s where it has the lever, the lever switch. So it's like off, on, and then, uh, then test, I think we call it. And yeah, we call that the captain's twitch. Because if you remember, just give yourself a quick, uh, quick flip, and it it'll tell you just two seconds whether uh, whether you're actually monitoring the correct frequency or not. Push button uh, operation for speaker or headset, very very simple. Speaker at the top and phone. Well, just think of it as headphones. Push switches when it's actually selected in, you're going to hear from that source. So you can have more than one selected at, at, at any given time. You can have COM1 and COM2 pushed in, have one and then two, uh, the, and the ADF. So you could be listening to CIL650 at the same time or listening to more side on two, two independent VORs, as well as having two radios blasting at you at some point, uh, or a uh, combination of many positions. Uh, most are unused in the small aircraft. So let me just get us back to the, uh, the page before. Uh, you can see. There's off, so you can turn the whole the whole shooting match off. There's a telephone, so if it had like a satellite phone or something like that uh, in it, COM1 and COM2 are up at the top, and then they have uh, intercom, if that's the way the system's wired. I've, I've only seen that in helicopters. And then uh, you have external for uh, if you have a loud hitter. When I worked at Orca, we had actually one plane that had it in the, had it in the nose compartment. <laughs> it's going to be used. Uh, I'd be very surprised if you had a loud hailer or intercom in GMA. I didn't ask Brian about that, but <laughs> I'm just going to assume no. Uh, this can lead to issues in use. This is why we're touching on this. And believe me, I have done this many times. No judgment. No judgment whatsoever from this guy. Calling on the wrong frequency. Yeah. It's happened to uh, That sort of thing. Uh, that you basically have to figure out how you can get around this and make it work for you. And what I use is, I just made up a name for it, I call it the Count Technique. <laughs> like uh, Sesame Street. Um, and all it is, is really just counting from the extreme positions on either side. We saw it went off all the way around in, a, in a 180 degrees, uh, all six <laughs> positions. Uh, so you can do it without even looking. So in a Valuable in a high workload situation, critical phase of flight. You're coming into approach, you told your number two to somebody else, you know, traffic's over here, sort of thing. And, uh, you know, you want to advise somebody on air to air that you're landing or something like that. You know, you can just do the count from one way or the other. So, my simple rule is COM1 is three from the left. So, you turn it all the way to the left, and then knowing that's number one, two, three. So, you can be looking out the window, you can do it whatever, and you can switch the other column. So, 
That's basically all I do. So this is very important when there's low volumes of traffic, especially at night. You know, everything's calm, beautiful. You're just cruising along. You didn't notice that when you went to push, you know, COM two to monitor it, that your finger kind of brushed COM one and it popped out. You know, so uh, you're you're thinking you're monitoring two frequencies and you're only monitoring one. So uh, very important when there's low volumes of traffic. It'll become quickly apparent when there's high volumes of traffic. But sometimes you can just kind of cruise along and uh, just be oblivious to that. So, I almost got some guys from Whitney Naval Station when we were trying to run down and my co-pilot deselected it. <laughs> Thanks, buddy. Not my, a wonderful audience, but uh, and thank you for bearing with me for what is uh, a fairly long time. Um, but is there anything that uh, we would like to review? Anybody have any? Are those okay. videos on YouTube, you know? Uh, yes. 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 Yeah. Yes, they are. Okay. They're embedded on the JPI site, I believe. Okay. But it is a YouTube bar. Okay, so, cool. Yeah. Right. Yeah. You can definitely find those on YouTube. And the manuals are all there too. So yes. I'm yeah. just I'm I look after the website, so I'm just thinking I'll just link to that. Oh, stuff. you put some links up. Yeah. Fantastic. Sorry, I didn't. I didn't. I wasn't aware uh, uh, that you had something like that. No, but it's easy to do. Yeah. Well, if uh, yeah, I can even do it, if you want me to, I can send you links. Or okay. Yeah. I'll send them to Brian, and then Brian can send them to you. Sure. Because cool. yeah. it's all in my browser history. I can just nice. Yeah, okay. so. yeah, just uh, one, one thing to quickly uh, uh, review is if, if I'm fueling the aircraft and, you know, one one to stay within weight and balance, and I know that I can only take on 35 gallons of fuel. Mm -hmm. So the, uh, the, fuel, uh, the, the fuel flow analyzer, what you suggest is, you know, fill it to full, which is 50 gallons indicated there, and then you just sort of reduce the fuel to bring it down to the 30 mark. Yeah, yeah. that would be the, smart, the smartest way, way to go. Or depending on whatever load was left, if somebody, say, landed <coughs> with 11 gallons remaining, and you've bumped up to, you're bumping up to 20 or something like that, then it's easiest just to, just to go to the add mode and just add fuel from that point. So yeah. <laughs> Well, there's a lot of information there, and uh, I'm surprised I was able to stay awake through it all. Uh, but but it's it's really helpful. I think uh, you know the instrumentation of my plane is quite different, but uh, the the whole idea of watching cylinder head temperature, I I, I have to confess that I not really paid a whole hell of a lot. Of, I'm always watching exhaust gas temperatures, and so I guess I've got a new challenge at me there. It's it's a balance. It's a balance. Don't yeah. don't 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 do one to the exclusion of the other. Right. But just be very very mindful. Great right. word. Hmm? What's that whole package word? Uh, as far as the the cost, the overall cost for the the thing. Yeah, like if we wanted to put that in, say, one of our other aircraft. Oh oh, I I see what you're saying. Um, the instruments. Yeah. Yeah. I I haven't looked at the list value for the specific installation that you guys have. I suspect it would have been cheaper, but. I did. I self brokered the seven, the, the second seven sixty that we bought. I went down to Miller Road and, and got it out of Hawk with Customs, and we paid fifty six hundred dollars. And all it had was oil, oil temperature, and fuel. Well, all of the uh, people for showing up tonight yeah. again, Brian, uh, for having the wisdom to. Uh, yeah. 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 Yeah.